others in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Let no man despise your youth. It implies that youth can be despised, overlooked, undervalued. But despised is even a stronger word than those two. And Paul is encouraging, he's exhorting a young Timothy, and he's saying, that don't succumb to the limited expectations that people have for you and your youth. But rather, be an example. Show, show yourself to be a true leader. Recently, we were talking about revival, and we were talking about the place of youth within revival. And what we find in church history is that many of the greatest revivals, the awakenings and other things that have happened in this world, were initiated by youth. In other words, God worked through the vessels of the young and brought about change, sometimes to a country, sometimes to the world. It often begins with youth groups, college students like we recently saw in Asbury. But God has done some of his greatest works throughout history using young men and women. And I'd like to give some examples of that today. So when you go back <clears throat> to the Old Testament, uh, and I'm just going to pick some random uh, names that you'll recognize from the Bible. God had promised Abraham that he would make him into a great nation. And one of the ways that God prepared that nation was through the, a, a few generations later, uh, a man named Joseph. Joseph was 17 years old when, he, um, when God sent him on the path to becoming the prime minister of Egypt, the greatest superpower of their day. Of course, Joseph at the time was the youngest of his brothers. But this was a young man that God had chosen for a very specific task. And it was through the, uh, the influence and the power that he would eventually arise to that he was able to bring his family into the land of Goshen. And that became an incubator for the entire nation. So God used Joseph, and also at a time of great famine. So this was a time where, where Joseph had been raised up, as he said to his brothers, you, you meant what you did for evil when you, you know, sold me into slavery. But through God's providence, he says, but God, he worked it together for good. He saved many people alive. And so Joseph was a young man who was set on a path to becoming an agent of preservation for not only his people, but for the known world of his day. It's worth noting that later when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, you might recall that the older generation, the first generation, failed where the following generation succeeded, and that is to take the land of Canaan. And it was the first generation that <clears throat> saw these amazing works of God, and you would think that their faith would be the strongest. But in the end, everyone over the age of 20 died in the wilderness because of their lack of faith and disobedience. Sometimes that happens uh, in the church where you have a generation that maybe is succeeded by a generation that does better than the previous generation. Later in Israel's history, uh, you're familiar with the story of Samuel, where God chose this boy to occupy the role of Israel's last judge. It was the time of the judges, but transitioning into the time of the, the, the kingdom, where you would have a, a prophetic role that was <clears throat> given uh, like the Old Testament prophets. He was really the first of the Old Testament prophets. And so you have this, this boy selected by God for this great task. He would grow up to anoint Israel's kings. And we know when he came to the house of Jesse, we learned a very powerful lesson as he went down the line of Jesse's sons, anticipating which one might be the anointed one, the one that God would have him anoint king. And it turned out to be the youngest, David, out in the field. The one who was overlooked by everyone else was the very one God had chosen. And what was the lesson of that? Samuel learned that, that lesson. Man is looking at the outward appearance, but God is looking at the heart. Is it possible that God is looking into the hearts of young people today and maybe finding things in those young hearts that he's not finding in the hearts of those who are more mature? And speaking of David, he was a man who was chosen to be championed by God to fight the giant. God loves to put himself on display through weakness, through human limitation. And so he 
pick the most unlikely person to go against Goliath. And of course, God would have him to be Israel's king, Israel's greatest king. David's son Solomon took the throne when he was probably 19 to 20 years old. And the greatest strength of Solomon was his understandings of the limitations of his youth. Do you remember what he said to the Lord? He said, now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in my father David's place, but I am only a little child, not knowing how to go out or to come in. God had asked him. He said, you can ask something of me, one thing. And of all the things he could have asked for, and in youth you can imagine some of the things you might ask for when you're young, but he asked for something that typically is the result of, of age, which is wisdom. God gave the greatest wisdom that he's ever gifted any person he put into the heart of a very young person. You have Josiah. How old was Josiah when he became king? Does anyone know? Eight, Eight years old. It's like my, my son Ethan being king. Can you imagine? <laughs> Eight years old. It tells us in 2 Chronicles 34 that <clears throat> by the age of 16, he was already uh, imposing reforms upon his people to go, come back to the law of God, back into obedience, renovating and cleansing the temple. It said of him in 2 Kings 23, this is referring to Josiah, uh, like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. Later when God was going to punish the nation for departing from the law, he sent a young prophet named Jeremiah. And if you're in Jeremiah chapter 1, I want you to notice this in verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. And look at his response. Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to, to deliver you, declares the Lord. It's estimated that Jeremiah may have been a 17 year old, something in that range. But imagine putting the weight and burden of that prophecy onto someone so young, and yet this is the very one that God had raised up for that purpose. Once Israel was in the captivity, you have the remnant's most notable characters being Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. In other words, the ones that the Bible takes note of during the captivity were the youth. The youth group of Israel, they were the ones holding the line in the time of captivity. And also during the captivity, when God sought a, a champion to keep his people preserved in the face of opposition, he raised up young Esther to turn the heart of the king. She helped to thwart a plan that would have otherwise eradicated her people. Hundreds of years later, when God determined to send his Messiah into the world, he called upon a young girl named Mary, who was probably 14, something around there at the time. Joseph would have been 18 at the least. And I want you to think about Jesus for a moment. When it came to picking his disciples, Jesus didn't choose the sages of his day, the old men, to be his disciples. And I know how it's often portrayed, and I think this is an area where we failed in our portrayal of the disciples in most of the movies and portrayals that we see. And that is, a lot of times they show the disciples as being as old as Jesus and sometimes even older than Jesus. There's nothing explicit that is stated about the age of the disciples, but there's a lot that we can infer from uh, Jewish culture. Does anyone know, how, how old were you when you were... Uh, formal education ended. For us, it's like 18. Do you know how old it was for the, the Jewish young person? It was 15. 
So their formal education ended at 15, and they had a choice. They could go into their, their father's trade, or a trade of sorts. Um, they could also, if they were more, maybe more intelligent, uh, maybe a greater capacity for learning, uh, they would look for a rabbi to take them as a student. And so Jewish rabbis would typically choose students from the age of 15 to 20, somewhere in that range. The married age uh, of a, a Jewish uh, young man was 18. When they turned 18, many of them were married off. And this is something else we glean from the disciples, and that is that not many of them were married that we know of, except Peter. So Peter was probably, we know he was at least 18. Uh, he may have been even in his 20s, mid-20s, but probably the older of the group. And it may be one of the reasons that he's always looked to as kind of the leader of the disciples. I mean, you get a bunch of guys who are, you know, 15 to 18 years old, and you got a 25-year-old in the mix, you know, that guy's an old guy. And so they're looking to Peter. Just <clears throat> Maybe Matthew, too, being a tax collector kind of implies a lot of responsibility for a youth. So he may have been in his 20s as well. I don't know. We know James and John had the characteristics of youth. They were the sons of thunder. <laughs> James likes that. Sons of thunder. And their mother, on one occasion, beseeches Jesus to allow her sons to sit on his right hand uh, when he's on his throne. And the very appeal of the mother is an indication that they were probably pretty young because for a grown adult man, it wouldn't be typical for his mother to do something like that. So in other words, the disciples that Jesus chose were probably the age 15 to 20, maybe mid-20s at the most. And what that means is that Jesus turned over the future of his church to men who would have been 18 to mid-20s by the time he had died. Men who only had three years of ministry training. Just think about that for a minute. The building of the church was accomplished by youth. Now that may not be that hard to imagine in a church like this, where this church started, if I understand correctly, with a lot of young families. Is that true? And many of you, how many of you were here, just curious, how many of you were here when the church started? We saw quite a few. From the stories that I've heard, when it came time to build this church, these young families banded together. And, and to their own admission, some of them have told me that we didn't really know what we were doing. But they moved forward. By God's grace, something amazing was started. I love the story of a church's beginning. I'm going to talk about our future and the time we have remaining. And I want to start that off by asking the question. Because some of you were here when the church was founded, and maybe at the time you were... You were a young family. Maybe you had young kids. Maybe you didn't even have kids yet. But you saw what God can do in spite of age and experience, even though you maybe didn't know what you were doing and you made mistakes along the way. Do you remember the thrill of being involved in the common work? I know Randy's told me a lot of stories about the founding of this church and the excitement and how everybody was committed to the work. Everyone was pulling their weight. There was a lot of excitement. Now let me ask you the question. As you look at the second and third generations since that time, do you see the same excitement? Do you see the same concerted effort among those young families? Would you say that those generations feel the same ownership of the church that you feel? I mean, but frankly, you built this church. This is your church. That's how you're going to feel if you're involved in the start of a church. And, and so should you from that standpoint that you had a part in that. But the question becomes then, how do we pass off that ownership 
to following generations. If a young family were asked today, is this your church? How do you think they would respond? Would they say, yes, this is my church? And would they have that sense of ownership? Or would they say, this is, well, I, I go to the church, but this is my parents' church. This is my grandparents' church. And if they didn't feel the same ownership that you felt and maybe feel now, the question becomes, how do we get them to that point where they feel that ownership like you do? The thing about this church is it has a lot going for it when it comes to youth. We've got a lot of ministries geared towards our youth. And I think of all the things we do as a church, this may be the thing that we do best as a church. You know, no, no church can be involved in, in everything. There are churches out there, they have tremendous ministries for those with addiction. And that's like their niche. And they have a tremendous ability to reach those people. Maybe their youth group isn't as big, but that's what they're good at. I think we're probably good at quite a few things, but I think of all the things as a church we're good at, caring for our youth has been um, probably our, our greatest gift as a church. So let's mention some of our ministries. How are we ministering to our youth? Well, we saw one this morning, much good moment. Where we involve the children in the adult portion of the service. That's important. It gives them a sense that this is about them too, not just about the adults, right? Then we have children's church for them. While church is um, ongoing for the adults, we have it for children. We have VBS that started back up. We have our Awana ministry. How many, by the way, are involved in Awana? We have quite a few volunteers from the church that come on Mondays. <clears throat> it's been incredible. 412, it's our youth group. But we have ministry people beyond our own church. What about Lighthouse in the high school and the middle school? So you have Josh teaching. Um, did, did you refer to it as middle school or junior high? Middle school? So you have Josh in the middle school. You have Maggie in the high school. Those are our youth spreading the word of God in the schools. And let me tell you, that's not easy. Uh, when I was in high school, I had a Bible class in my school. And it takes... Uh, it takes a lot of courage for a young person to identify themselves, not just as a Christian, but somebody who's going to teach others the Bible in school. That's tough. We've got Life Trial. And Courtney's, you know, she's been doing a lot with the youth, but she had this on her heart to start a local chapter of Life Tribe, which is very much about grounding our youth, giving them skills apologetically so that they can defend their faith. We have, also, we have other ministries too, Cam. Other opportunities for our, our young people to be involved in ministry. And then of course we have great youth leaders. And those youth leaders, it's very amazing to watch because those are young individuals who are once in our youth group. So to see that transition into leadership is just, it's a beautiful thing to see. I said this before too, that <clears throat> Excuse me. We have some exciting things happening in our youth. We have some young people right now who are really on fire for Christ. And our responsibility as a church is to help foster those flames, to open opportunities of discipleship. I know personally when talking to some of these young ones who have recently come to faith and they're excited about the Bible, and they ask a lot of questions. I've got to put aside at least... Uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes after every service, every time I'm at the church, because Adrian back here wants to ask me every question he's thought of all week. And I love it. But to get Bibles into their hands and to get theology books, and that's something I've been doing, buying them. It's just a little book called Survey of Bible Doctrine by Ryrie, and I've been giving that out to newer believers, young people, because I believe they're capable of so much more than we give them credit for. I started my journey at, at 14 years old. By 15, I was reading Systematic Theology by Lewis Berry Chafer, which is a seven-volume set on theology. I wasn't even a good student, but I had a hunger, and I had the Spirit of God, and that's what they have as well. They are capable of great things. I lump our young families in with our youth because in some ways our young, our young adults are 
are still kind of like the youth is from the standpoint they're young in the Lord. And society looks at someone in their mid-20s, even in their lower 30s, as being young people, fairly young. And it's those individuals in our church, those young families, that are raising our youth. So we're working in partnership with them to help train their children. And of course, that, uh, that generation, those younger families, those men and women represent the future leadership of our church. This church has done a great job in training previous generations, young people. But there comes a time in, in a church's lifespan where it starts purposefully, intentionally passing ownership to the following generations. It's very intentional. It doesn't happen by accident. You know, one of the things we talk about in the board is how to, um, how to get some more of the young men into leadership. You know, I realize that typically an elder is an older person or at least an experienced person, someone who's been in the faith for some period of time. But we're talking about ways to expose young men to leadership. And we, as a board, we've, we've been working on um, an, kind of an elder in training position that would tap those young men who have the character, they have the experience to the, to the point where they're ready to get a taste of leadership. And, that elder in training program is just, and this is what I did. I, I was an elder in training for years before I became an actual elder. But it was, it's the point is to give them exposure to leadership. Because, of, you know, a lot of times the, the, the young men might be asked, as they were this past time when we, we had um, openings for new elders, there's a n number of young men who were asked, would you consider being an elder? And they weren't ready. And to their credit, they, <clears throat> they were hesitant to jump into something they didn't understand entirely. But the, to give them a taste of it for a period of time, for at least a year, before they make the decision if that's something they feel led to be a part of. But start intentionally getting them involved in the process so we can transition leadership. And I realize that doesn't happen in one generation, right? That transition takes time. But if you think about it, you think these... Uh, Young guys, you say, well, they're not old enough to be elders. Just remember that the people that Jesus chose to be the founders and leaders of the church, they were not old men. One of the death blows to a local church is waiting too long to start that transition where you're, you're handing it off to the next generation. Now the question is, how are we doing with that handoff? I think we're. I think the church has been intentional over the years of training up these young people, but maybe a little bit behind the curve in in some areas. And, and the reason I say that is because when dealing with the young families, and my wife and I, we've been the ones kind of spearheading the young families ministry. And I ask that question. I ask it very openly of the young families. Do you consider this church to be your church? They got slightly different answers from some, but I'll, let me just boil it down. It's kind of like what I said before. Well, it's, it's the church I grew up in. It's my parents' church. My grandparents' church. But the general sentiment is this church belongs to the older generation. Now, you can disagree with that, you know, as they say, perception is reality. And for those who believe that or feel that way, we don't want to dismiss that. <laughs> Presbyterian Church in town, as you know, lost their pastor, Pastor John. I got to know Pastor John um, over the years. He's been gone for about a year now, maybe. I don't know. But I know that they have struggled as a church. We can pray for them. As many smaller churches, they've struggled. Uh, they had an interim pastor come in who looked at the church with fresh eyes. And he saw what Pastor John saw. Pastor John used to talk to me about the need for uh, some changes, you know. And a new pastor came in, an interim, who, was, who basically said, we need to rent, we need to it's change a lot of things. I think they changed their name. don't know what else they've changed. But a lot of the vision that he brought, they, 
just said, no, it's too much change. So I guess he didn't stick it out. But I heard from a young family who recently left there. They said, there's not many young families left. And tragically, that is happening to a lot of churches. And I'll just say that it's been happening to our church. In case you haven't noticed, there has been an exodus of young families. And that's very concerning to me as a pastor. That should be very concerning to you as well. That's our future. Our future leading. Where are they going? Well, some are moving out of state, understandably. Many of them are just moving to the bigger, more exciting churches. And, and for me, as a, a student of ministry, having been in a lot of different churches, I like to ask those kinds of questions. What is it about the big churches that has a draw to people? Because they do. You can't deny it. And we realize that with this church, we will never be a mega church. We will never have the vibe of a mega church. I don't care how big we get. This is a country church. But I'll tell you what some of the bigger churches are doing, and they're doing very well, is they are gearing the ministry so that it's very relevant, cultural relevant. I've talked about this in the past. Right? You have certain non-negotiables. The truth of God's word and worship and fellowship. You know, these are the, the mainstays of what church life is it's all about. You don't change those things. But the methodology and how those things are delivered. You know, the Bible doesn't get real specific in the New Testament about um, things like music. I was talking with Pastor Bill about this very thing. About how, you know, generations see change. And he himself, as an older pastor, made the statement, something to the effect that, you know, the old ways just don't work with young people. Things change. I want you to uh, allow yourself fresh eyes for just a moment. Can, are you capable of this? You walk into this church, and you, and you just see it through the eyes of the first time that you've ever been here. And let me ask you the question, what is your impression? That's very hard to ask because many of you have been here for decades. But putting on those fresh eyes, what do I see? I think what we can say is that the people who come here recognize that we're a friendly church and that we have some great people in this church. You know, all of you are amazing. But maybe a first impression might also Take notice of the uh, 80s vibe that we've got going on in the, in the building here. Something that's just a little bit dated. I've been talking with the board recently, and we, we've kind of shifted gears as a board. We're still doing what needs to get done related to business and otherwise, but we've really recognized the need to be addressing more things related to our vision, related to the health of the, the church, and so we've been talking more about the future. What does the future look like for us? One of the practical um, observations that we can make is that the church, because it is somewhat dated, <coughs> could be modernized. I know I, I could get lynched after the service for talking about paint color in a, in a church. I had a lady... Um, my first church, <clears throat> after we had a fire and had no choice but to renovate, left the church because of you know the color of the wall and the fact that we didn't have pews anymore. We had to switch to chairs. Can't go to a church that doesn't have pews. Can't go to a church that has that color of walls. It turns out, I mean, she was legally blind. <laughs> but left the church over the color of the walls. So I know it's a, del it's a delicate subject. It's a superficial step. But don't discount the draw of a modern facility. You know, we were at uh, Life Tribe over at the uh, community church in Willink. How many of you know Pastor Robert? Any of you? When, when I went into the church, I had a first impression, as I do in every church I enter. I'm always aware of churches because church and, you know, that ministry, is, it's my life. So when I walk into someone else's church, I'm always looking around to get ideas and such. But I looked around this church. He's got a good thing going here. The, the, the walls were nice and bright. He has great lighting options. So the, the uh, media presence, the sound system, everything was really 
modern. And so after the service, I went to Pastor Robert and I congratulated him on, you know, the, the church having, it was a bright, cheery first impression. And he told me that they had just been through um, a recent renovation where they addressed all of that. Their, their building, I guess, I don't know if you've been in it prior to that, but I hadn't been, so it was dated. But unfortunately, it was, it was more of a reaction than being proactive. They, they made these changes after they realized they were losing people. And you get behind the curve, and you make changes just being reactive when you realize, oh my goodness, we have to do something. Everyone's leaving. You don't want to get to that point. You want to be ahead of the curve. made me think of um, our church as I was at that meeting and how, man, we could do a lot with our church, with just the building we have. We can modernize that. And paint in and of itself isn't all that expensive. Just a change of color as a start. Not a big deal. Maybe for some it might be. But it's, it's a little drab. Lighting's a little bit yellow in this room. And if you've ever watched our uh, videos online, it's not a very appealing video to watch because of the color tones. Just a small thing. But the modernization of the church can, can do a lot for people's first impressions. What about Christian contemporary music? We have some great music today. Great song choices. There was a hymn at the beginning. and I think they, they, they're doing an incredible job. And this church has done an incredible job of incorporating a blended service. I'm just going to point out the fact that as this church continues to move forward, there's going to be a need for more emphasis on the contemporary, just because the, the change in, in preference. You have people under the age of 30 right now who don't connect very well with hymns. And that's a gross generalization. I grew up with them. Some of you have, even if you're young, and so you like the hymns. The Pastor Bill and I talked about that as well. Or are connecting with the old music. And you ask my kids, you know, they grew up with hymns too in the first church we were at where we switched to a, a more blended service. But my kids, like there's a, a switch that flips in them when we sing a hymn and then it's like, I don't get it. I don't connect with this. But then you go to, you sing the song after and it's contemporary and suddenly it comes alive. It's just a change and, and things have always changed throughout time, sounds. Those things aren't static, they change. And in a continued incorporation of our young people in our worship. Just consider the fact that these young ones, someday this is going to be their church. And you see how much, uh, how much it would do for a young person to give them a part in something like worship. And I know Maggie and Addie have helped out, I think last week they were helping out, and even the week before. Things like that, that's very healthy for us. To get them involved. Give them a sense of ownership of the worship. One of the other emphasis that I think as a church we can, we can do better is um, getting out into the community to engage our youth. To engage families, young people. Tom and I... Um, hang out quite a bit. And of course, he's one of my elders, but we talk as friends more than we talk as fellow elders. And we talk about the church all the time. And we've had this dream that we've dreamed together for probably the last year or two. And we talk about it quite frequently. And it's our need as a church to be more in the community. And we got this idea, and this is just in concept, no decisions have been made. Um, I did talk to the board about it and, and found that the board is very open to God doing something amazing, doing a big work here. But over the years, I've been wondering, why, why shouldn't we, as a church, open an FBC-backed youth center in Woodlake? Now stick with me for a minute. Because this is what we dream about, and that is taking one of these storefronts downtown and transforming it into a, like a cafe, a hangout spot for kids. You know, drinks and snacks, maybe have some foosball tables, pool tables, gaming consoles so kids can come in and game. A safe place for kids to come and hang out 
and have it run by FBC, staffed by FBC volunteers. It could be a multi-purpose facility where you have small groups meet there, ladies' meetings. I've even thought as a church that we should be engaged with how, how do we connect with the Hispanic community in Woodlake? How do we have how can we have a you know a Spanish service for some of those that maybe don't speak English? That would be another great opportunity with having some spaces to have a service led by someone uh, who, who also knows Spanish. Now that's me dreaming. I don't know if that'll happen or not. I don't know if the church is even open to things like that. It took me a year or two to muster the courage to even talk to the board about it. But what I found was a board that says, you know what? We can dream big for God. And Dave likes to quote uh, Hudson Taylor. You know, God's will done in God's way will never lack God's supply. And that's the only question we need to ask ourselves. What is God's will moving forward? That's all that matters. Because immediately when I say a, a facility that's in the youth center in Woodlake, you've got dollar signs in your head saying, well, where are you going to get the money for that? It's the first thing many of you thought of. God in the history of this world has never been limited by resources. The only question is whether it's his will, something to that effect. The only restriction, it, restriction won't be money. The restriction will be a faith too small to trust that God can do big things. That is the only thing that would restrict us as a church. I just think, and we're moving into the end times where things are getting worse. This isn't the time to be reactive. We have to be proactive as a church. And so my question about something like a youth center is why not think about getting into Woodlake? Because I see that even as a potential place to put my office. You know, I don't really have a designated office. I know I've got one back here, but it's really multi-purpose rooms so people come and go. I thought, man, wouldn't that be awesome to have an office in a you know, in a youth center in Woodlake, where you, you know, this is a point of contact between our church and the community. Presently, we don't have that. And just think of the community. Should we provide services like that? How they would look at our churches? Oh, that's a church that cares about this community. They're in this community. They're doing something for our youth. That means an awful lot to parents when you take care of their kids. It's not enough for us as a church to wait around for the next generation to come to us. We gotta go get them. That's how it works. Go in all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus didn't say just sit you know, on your backside and wait for people to come to you. And this is something we can do better. As I said, we do many things very well as a church. I love the, 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 all the ministries we have, but the ministry of youth is a special thing. And I'm in awe when I see how many kids come out to Awana and Port 12 for being a small church. I was in a bigger church where our youth group wasn't as big as the youth group here. I think that we had a total of 900 people and we had a smaller youth group than this church. This church is doing a lot of things right, but I just want to invite you to dream with me. I've been dreaming for a lot of years. You know, they tell a pastor when you come into a church, don't make a lot of changes at first. Well, it really didn't. I think I changed the pulpit for this table, and that was my first big scandalous change that I implemented. But otherwise, because of the disruption of COVID and all this other stuff, we, we've been in a, a survival mode. And we're just trying to get back to status quo because we're not even back to that yet. But I think God honors big faith. I think God honors dreams. And so I'm sharing some of those dreams with you today. I dream of this place being modernized. Just the, on its face being a place that... Maybe where people, it's not that it makes it a better building, but it, maybe it's less distracting. Sometimes the aging of a building can just be a little distracting, make you feel like it's dated. People want to feel like something is, is a little bit more modern. Next week, we're going to have a baptism service, and some of those youth that I mentioned today are going to be sharing their testimonies. And I think you're going to be blown away by what God is doing in and I just pray as a church that we continue as we narrow down our emphasis and focus. And that's really what you do with vision, right? You don't have a hundred different visions. You have primarily a main vision. And I think ours is youth. I think it's what we're best at. And I think if we stick with that, we guarantee the future of our church. It's a win-win. I just ask you to join me in this journey.
If you have any thoughts on this, um, I'm open to hearing what you think about something as big a, as a dream as a youth center. I'm just curious what people are willing to believe God for here. Father, we were reminded today in how some of the greatest works that have ever been done in the history of this world were done through youth, where you, as God, with an understanding of the limitations of age when someone is that young, that in spite of that, you chose those individuals to do great things for you, putting on display that you are a God whose strength is made perfect in weakness. I pray as a church, Lord, that we would come alongside you as you do a work in our youth. And I see you're doing one. I see the passion and zeal coming out of some of these young ones, the desire for ministry, desire to get involved, to teach, to do worship. Lord, that is a stirring that you're currently doing in the hearts of these young ones. And we as a church want to just co-labor with you to continue to have these ministries. And I'm so thankful, Lord, for everyone. Time would fail me to mention each and every one who has been involved um, in the youth ministries of our church, not just directly teaching youth, but in the background, helping just wherever help is needed. And how valuable that is that so many have come together around this common vision for the next generation. And I pray for our next generation. I look at where things are heading in this world. They're gonna have it rough. Many of them. And I just pray, Father, that we can equip and prepare them to be the church in their generation, just as we've been the church in ours. And help us to dream big, Father. I don't know what you'll have us to do when it comes to something like a youth center or getting into Woodlake. All I know is that it's your will and desire that we go and that we do something. Put on our hearts what to do. Help us to follow you and even decisions as small as choosing a paint color for a, a, a church, or just simple modernization. Lord, help us with each step and unite us as a group, Lord. I know with change comes sometimes division, but I pray the opposite. I pray that with the thought of change would come excitement and unity, people passionate about moving forward together with the understanding that you're doing work in this place and we just want to be a part of it. We look forward to next week, what you have for us, Lord, with all those testimonies, to see our youth in action, leading us in worship, sharing with us their life testimonies and making the commitment of baptism, Lord. That is, is gonna be such a special thing. And I, again, would pray you push back the rains for that time. Give us a, a rain-free day where we can just enjoy some sunshine and fun. We ask it all in Christ, in Christ's name, amen. Well, I hope you join us next week. And even if it's raining, we'll have a contingency. We'll, we'll figure something out. Um, but we will have the baptisms either way. So if, if we end up having to have service inside because of the blowing rains or something, we will still have the baptism. Please come for that because you're going to be blessed beyond what I can say with the testimony of these young people. Look forward to seeing you next week.